Hey gang, welcome back to the Wilson Combat Channel, where we listen to you and answer your questions as best we can. My name is Masada Yub, one of the many content providers here. And the, what I've been asked to address today, a request from one of our viewers, for our take on the McCluskey case. In 2020, during the George Floyd protests and riots, the McCluskeys were a husband-wife attorney team in St. Louis, Missouri. One of those protests was going on and a large group of protesters had trespassed onto their rather palatial residential property. They were taking uh, videos and the videos showed Mr. McCluskey with an AR-15 magazine in place and his wife with a little Brico type pistol both of them are waving the guns around, muzzles crossing people, and Mrs. McCluskey in particular, gesturing and appearing to point her gun at people with her finger on the trigger. This was not taken well, and the, uh, the media was sympathetic to the protesters, and it became something of a cause celeb. Uh, they were charged with all manner of aggravated assault, etc., etc. Now, pointing a lethal weapon at someone you have no right to take at gunpoint does indeed constitute the serious felony of aggravated assault. But things have to be taken within context, and in this case, were taken largely within political context. To make a long story short, they pled guilty to misdemeanors, and kept their right to own firearms. I understand the firearms in the case themselves were confiscated, and they were later uh, pardoned by a sympathetic governor. Now, I think all of us in the gun world can feel some sympathy to people threatened by what they perceive to be a hostile crowd illegally on their property. So let's take the McCluskey case as a kickoff point and focus in general on the idea of stepping outside your home when you perceive yourself to be threatened with a lethal weapon in hand and being possibly perceived as threatening others with those lethal weapons. We all know the castle doctrine, the, the heritage of the English common law from which our own derives, remains strong in the United States. The castle doctrine says the citizen's home is their castle Attacked there, they need not retreat before using necessary force to defend themselves and said dwelling. The question comes, what exactly is the dwelling? Generally, it'll be perceived as the four walls of the home itself and curtilage. Curtilage, by definition, may actually vary state to state, depending whether you're some place where the laws were made at a time when the state was an agrarian economy or uh, a more urban one, such as obviously St. Louis. The front porch, for example, will generally be seen as curtilage and an attached building. In some rural areas, a barn or other outbuildings within a certain distance of the home proper may also be seen as curtilage. What you've got here in macrocosm is something that we have been seeing now for 30 years. When they invade the house itself, it's clear-cut defense of the castle. When you step outside armed to engage the trespassers, it can be seen otherwise. They don't see you as defending the home anymore. They don't see you as defending the castle. They see you as the crusader who lowered the drawbridge, went marching out to seek the foe on a crusade, and a whole lot of folks, when they think crusade, their word association is fanatic. Let's go back in time, right about 30 years, to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, the case was Hattori versus Pierce. If you want to look it up, it's H-A-T-T-O-R-I versus Pierce, an unusual spelling, I believe it was P-E-A-I-R-S. Rodney Pierce and his young wife in the late 20s uh, lived in a neighborhood with their two little boys. The neighborhood had been going downhill in terms of crime, and I understand the wife in particular was very nervous about it, understandably, and they were even looking around for a better place to live. 
The incident occurred a few days before Halloween and the, the tragic set of circumstances that set it up. There was a young man named Yoshiro Hattori, a Japanese exchange student, living in the area with the host family who had a 17-year-old American son. Well, when you're a, a visitor with you know, a host family, uh, it, the whole thing is cross-cultural, and you're looking for experiences in the country you're visiting that you wouldn't have in your homeland. One of those, apparently, was Halloween. So the two 17-year-olds were on their way to a pre-Halloween costume party. And I think the pre-Halloween element was a factor. Had it been Halloween night when everyone expects people in costumes to be coming to their doors, it almost certainly would have turned out differently. It's kind of oh dark 30. The two boys show up at what they think is the site of the party. Uh, turns out they have the wrong address, the common mistake of 127 North Elm Street instead of 127 South Elm Street, whatever the address may have been there. But in any case, they ended up at the uh, Pierce home. In America, when you're invited to a party, you don't ring the doorbell and wait for the butler to open the door. Okay, it's understood, it's a party, come on in, you know, you're invited. Well, they get to the house and they go to the back door and tr of course the door is locked, so there's the obvious distinct rattling of someone at the door. Mrs. Pierce hears that sound, looks out the window, and sees two strangely dressed men. The Japanese youth, Hattori, had been dressed as John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. Uh, this was early 1990s, remember. And he's holding a, a camera. The American kid has dressed up as an accident victim, and he's covered with bandages, which in turn are covered with fake blood. Mrs. Pierce looks at this strange tableau and screams to her husband, Rodney, they're trying to break in! Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Ju me just repeating it now, 30 years later, as a, an observer from far away. My God, I can feel my blood pressure rising. Picture you are the young husband, your two little boys at home, and you hear your wife scream that, given the fact there's been violent crime in the neighborhood. Rodney Pierce goes to the only loaded gun he keeps in the house, a Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum he uses for hunting. Runs downstairs. By that time, the two boys have gone out toward the front of the house. The young American would later testify that they were saying, hey, nobody's answering the door. I wonder if we're at the right address, or words to that effect. At that point, Rodney Pierce flung the front door open. And I think all of us can understand that. Okay, you're a parent. Your mate and your cubs are threatened by something. It's a human imperative, a mammalian imperative, to gather intelligence and find out what the hell is going on. And that's undoubtedly why he threw that door open. The American kid sees the gun and is like, oh my God, and freezes in place. The Japanese youth, Yoshiro Hattori, was seen to start moving forward with jerky movements like this, going toward Pierce. Now remember, it's, it's dim light, twilight, the porch lights are reflecting on his face. Pierce said later that his eyes in that light appeared to be red. He said like, like someone in a vampire movie. He's wondering what the hell drug is this guy on with these jerky movements. And he's coming toward him with a metal object in his hand that Pierce can't recognize. Pierce is screaming, freeze, freeze! The boy keeps coming toward him. It's, it's theorized that not being a a native English speaker, he thought Pierce was yelling, please, please. And when they were virtually in touching distance, Pierce felt he had no choice to protect his children, and he fired the single shot that instantly killed Yoshiro Hattori. He was charged with manslaughter, and he was acquitted. It was essentially what the law recognizes as an excusable homicide. The excusable homicide is distinct from the justifiable homicide in that the simple layman's translation is that a justifiable homicide is a determination that this person needed to be shot. The excusable homicide, much lesser known concept, means that, okay, in the 2020 hindsight of the Monday morning quarterback, this person should not have been shot. 
but within the totality of the unusual circumstances, any reasonable person would probably have made the same mistake. And for that reason, the person who did make that tragic mistake should be held harmless and not convicted, not punished. It was followed by the lawsuit of the family of the deceased, Hattori versus Pierce. In that, remember, the, the standards are, are different between criminal court and civil court. Criminal court, the crime must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. In civil court, the standard is preponderance of evidence, only a tipping of the balance to a greater than 50% certainty that there was recklessness and negligence that ended in the death. The kid was absolutely hammered with a massive judgment against him. It went to the Court of Appeals, and if you look it up, you'll find the appellate court decision, which found against Rodney Pierce and affirmed the judgment against him. And it said, in essence, that he had been safe inside his home, behind locked doors, with his children, even with a gun to protect himself, and that when he flung open that door and stepped out with a gun, he was seen as the initial aggressor. Now that's a pretty scary precedent, but we're seeing that again and again. I don't like it any better than you, but it's better for you to find out here and now from us than to find out from the judge later. Going out looking for trouble is a cornerstone element of wrongdoing. For a cop, listen, the very definition of police patrol is looking for trouble. But when the private citizen is perceived as looking for trouble, they become seen as the initial aggressor. You saw it later in a uh, very controversial case that we've seen controversy on here in the commentary at Wilson Combat, the George Zimmerman case, the shooting death of Trayvon Martin in 2012, leading to the, uh, the acquittal at criminal trial of George Zimmerman in 2013. People said because Zimmerman, who was in fact the duly elected uh, president of the, or captain rather, of the Neighborhood Watch, had, while talking to the dispatcher, been asked, where did he go? He being the, the suspect who turned out to be Trayvon Martin. And Zimmerman said, I don't know. So he stepped out of the car and went looking for him. The dispatcher said, are you following him? He said, yes. The dispatcher said, you don't need to do that and he stopped, ended the conversation, and was on his way back to the car when the fatal confrontation with uh, Trayvon Martin occurred. Even the people who recognized that Zimmerman was down and having his head bashed under the ground when he fired the single shot that ended Trayvon Martin's life, blamed George Zimmerman because he had gone looking for trouble. We've seen that precedent, it's out there in the jury pool, it's out there in our culture. And all of us, before we step outside with a gun in our hand, like the McCluskeys did, need to understand that and recognize it. The best advice, the most conservative advice, remain inside. Certainly keep your gun handy, call the police. If the door is breached, when they break in that door, now it's proof positive that the intruder is the initial aggressor. You are the defender, and you're going to be much more defensible. Again, I don't like it any better than some of you, but it's better to find out now from us than from the prosecutor later. Keep on asking your questions. Whether or not you like the answers, we'll give them to you as, as best we can and as straight as we can. We'll see you down the road here at Wilson Combat Channel.